So the first topic that we're going to cover this semester is a review almost of different network technologies. That is, uh, look at classifying how we can differentiate different types of networks, so form some classification, and look at some example technologies which we use on a regular basis or are popular or at least have been in the past and maybe in the future. That will take, uh, I think, all of this week to lecture this topic. And then after looking a little bit about how the internet is structured, then for the remaining topics of the semester, we'll look at individual technologies in detail. So this is a broad coverage of technologies. Later we go into in depth. This topic, you may know some of it already. So in some cases, it's a review. You've seen it last semester. Uh, some things will be new. So let's, let's start and see how we go. We want to list and compare popular uh, and in some cases future technologies for local area networks and wide area networks, both looking at wired and wireless. So that you're familiar with the different technologies which are in use today. At least some of them. There are more than what we can cover uh, in this topic. So first we'll categorise networks using different uh, factors and then we'll look at wired network technologies and then wireless technologies. We can talk about network technologies uh, in, or we can classify them in different ways. One way we classify them is based upon the geographical coverage of the network. How much area does it cover? in terms of meters and so on. So some of the acronyms uh, and the names that you've heard of, uh, starting well, from the smallest you may not have heard of, body area networks, that is networks that are on or around or within the vicinity of a body or maybe even a desk. So we're talking about technologies that provide coverage over centimeters, meters possibly. Maybe it's the connectivity between all the devices you may have on you, your camera, your watch, your phone, your headpiece, using Bluetooth and other, infra or other uh, wireless technologies. So there are some technologies which are designed to support this short range communications, meters maximum, it's tens, tens of centimeters in some case. And then if we go larger, then we get to local area networks which cover uh, offices, office buildings, homes, and we've seen plenty, or we've seen uh, enough detail about local area networks last semester and talked about Ethernet and the different types of Ethernet uh, that are available. And then if we go even further, then we talk about networks that cover metropolitan areas, cities, a metropolitan area network. So, for example, a large company that has offices across a city, maybe a bank that has branches throughout a city, they may connect them together using their own specific network technology. And that may be a different technology than that, what they would use within the office building, the LAN, and may be slightly different from what's used between cities, a wide area network. And at the largest area, we have wide area networks, typically sometimes across cities, sometimes between cities, or between towns or regions, and of course between countries across the globe. The technologies we use in each of these differ in most cases because they have different requirements, requirements in terms of the distance at which they cover and the speed at which we can transfer data, uh, so there are different solutions that are optimal for those uh, different coverage areas. Moving from personal body area networks up to the global area networks, wide area networks. The different technologies have trade-offs between the data rate, the distance and the cost. And we'll see some of those trade-offs when we look at example technologies. So we can categorise networks based upon the area which they cover. 
Another way to categorise networks is based on the users of those networks. Whether there are end users, customers like you and me who sit at a computer and access uh, the network resources, or there are no end users attached to the network but just different access networks or different networks attached to the network. Let's explain. If we differentiate between access networks and core networks. In this diagram of a large internet, we have many sub-networks, the clouds, and they are connected together in this example via routers to form an internet. The end users connect to the access networks. But the access networks to connect to other access networks, to allow an end user here to communicate with an end user here, the access networks in this case are connecting to a core network, which doesn't have end users directly attached, which then may connect to another core network and multiple core networks. And this is just a simple diagram with uh, several core networks. The difference is that the end users connect to the access network, whereas in the core network they do not. A core network carries the traffic of access networks or other core networks. And the technologies used within access networks and core networks may differ because they have different requirements in terms of the amount of traffic they need to carry, uh, the distance and the speed at which they uh, can transfer that data, the traffic. In terms of a core network, there's some related terminology include a backbone network. It's the backbone of the entire network that connects everything together. Or even a transport network. Not a transport protocol, don't get confused with the, the layers and a transport protocol, but sometimes this may be called a transport network. This network transports the data of other networks from here to here. So we get access to the internet via access networks, but our access networks are normally connected to the global internet via core networks. So my office computer, or even this computer, is connected to what we'd say an access network inside SIT. SIT has a router that connects via an internet service provider out to the wider internet. We could call that internet service provider, provider's network a core network. Maybe that ISP then connects to a larger ISP and then more ISPs. They form the core networks in the internet. So different technologies may be used in access networks versus core networks. They have different requirements of uh, what the users need in access and core networks. Inside an access network, we need to support the traffic. We need to have enough capacity to support the traffic between the users within the same access network, as well as from users in one access network to another. Think of SIT, say SIT, at least this campus, is one access network the capacity of the network must be sufficient to allow everyone within SIT to communicate with each other. I want to access the uh, internal web server or a database server where I can see the information about students. That's internal communications to SIT inside the access network. But also we want to access resources outside of SIT, out on the internet. So the capacity of the network needs to be sufficient to support both internal traffic and traffic going outside of the network. In a core network, we need to support the traffic going between multiple access networks. If we have, although there's only two computers shown, if we have 100 computers on this access network and 100 users here, then this technology needs to be selected to support uh, or to allow those 100 users to communicate with each other 
and also to communicate with people outside. And similar here, the technology needs to be chosen for this core network to allow the traffic from all 100 users on this access network to be transferred out to other networks and similar for this access network. So the core networks need to support traffic from other networks. So which one requires a larger capacity? If we just look at those points, which one requires the larger capacity? Core network. If we consider a simple example, an access network, a core network, so we can give an explanation or an answer and an explanation to my question, then we have users attached here and users attached here. Now I'll repeat my question, which network requires the most capacity and why? Access or core? First, the, some say core. Why? In this case, let's say we have, I know it's simple, we have three computers here and three on this access network. And they generate data, that is they send traffic into the network at some rate, let's say this one, each at one megabit per second. That is this one generates data and sends, needs to send at one megabit per second. And same with this one, one, one and all of them. Remember, some of the traffic may be internal only. So this access network needs to support 3 megabits per second at the same time. Three users all wanting to send at 1 megabit per second. Then we'd need enough capacity on this access network to support three megabits per second. It's a simplification of the scenario, but I'll try and explain the point. How much of that traffic, so if this one is sending at one plus one plus one, a total of three inside here, some of it is internal. That is, some of it is from here to here. From this one's perspective, whereas some goes external. Of the total of three megabits per second, if let's say 50% was internal then there's one and a half megabits per second going inside and a one and a half that needs to go outside of the total of three megabits per second traffic in this network only half of it goes out to the core network and we could do similar analysis from this perspective. So in this simple case, if we say half of it is internal traffic only, that is from here to some internal computer, a server for example, and half goes outside from this network's perspective, then the core network only needs to support this one and a half megabits per second. The core network doesn't need to support all three megabits per second of them sending. Another factor, all right, what is the split between internal and external? It depends upon the users and the applications. Maybe we have a, a population of 400 students using the computers at the same time, SIT, and they're all browsing YouTube, then a lot of the traffic is external in that case. But if we have 100 staff and they're all accessing the internal registration web server, then a lot of the traffic is internal. So it depends upon the, uh, the users and the applications they're using at a particular point in time. 
So the split I've used here of 50% is just an example to make my calculation simple. How much does a user normally send? Or how much traffic does a no user normally generate in a network? You use a computer sometimes, you access the internet, how much over a period of 24 hours, how much traffic do you think your computer sends or receives? Yeah, how much? Any idea? Very hard to know. Sometimes, maybe think about how much you're downloading. Sometimes you're downloading a lot. Maybe you visit a YouTube, you watch a video, so that's streaming video to you at a constant rate. But then you visit another web page and you spend two minutes reading it. During those two minutes, you're not downloading anything. And then you go have lunch, so over a period of one hour, you're doing nothing. And then you go back and you download a, a file over two hours, and so it's downloading a lot. So the amount of traffic that an individual user generates or receives is very hard to predict over a short period of time. But over a long period of time, and because it varies a lot over a period of one hour, it goes up and down. But if you average across all users in a network, then over long periods of time, then it's a little bit easier or possible to predict how much traffic a population of users will generate. And that's how people dimension their networks. They start to estimate, okay, on average, this user generates one megabit per second. Or every user generates one megabit per second. You may be two, you may be half, you may be zero, and so on. On average, if it's one megabit per second, then we can make some uh, measurements, uh, make some uh, design of the network to support that capacity. Access networks generally require or offer a higher speed than core networks. May, some of it's because of uh, how the technologies were built in the past, but you think about the networks that you have access to now. SIT's network uses a 100 megabit per second capacity wired LAN. If I want to transfer from my computer to another computer within SIT, I can do it at a rate of about 100 megabits per second, minus overheads. But from SIT out to our internet service provider, it's on the order of 15 or 20 megabits per second. That core network capacity is much less than the internal network capacity. It's not always the same. That, that rule is not always true, but in many cases that's the case, that the access networks offer higher speeds than the core network for the same cost. Of course, if you pay much more, you can get a core network with a higher speed. When we look at the example technologies, we'll see some cases of that. So, we need to choose technologies that will support our access network and usually we'll use different technologies to support our core network because they have different requirements. How else can we categorize networks? We've done it based on geographical coverage, based upon the users, based upon the transmission medium, wired versus wireless. It's an easy classification. Technologies that are wired versus those that are wireless. In a wired transmission medium, it's easy to control the signal. It stays within the wire, basically, with uh, uh, protection. It's relatively easy to protect from interference from other sources. Because our signal stays along the wire, we can have multiple wires next to each other, multiple cables, and they will not interfere with each other if we have the, the correct protection on them. As a result, we can get higher data rates less errors, more predictable speeds, constant data rates. In wireless, the benefits of wireless, we can be mobile and it can be convenient. 
but we usually get, compared to wired, lower data rates, more errors, and less predictable service. We may lose connectivity at some point in time. But these are the two main benefits of wireless communications. What else? We could categorise based upon the link configuration, whether we have point-to-point -point links or point-to-multipoint -point links. Point-to-point, -point, we have two devices attached to that link, one at each endpoint. Point-to-multipoint, we have multiple devices sharing a link. And because we share a link, we need some way to coordinate amongst those devices to know which one can transmit at which point in time. And that adds complexity when we have point to multipoint. It's harder to control who gets to transmit on the medium at which time to perform the sharing. But of course, being able to transmit to multiple people at the same time is of benefit some, for some applications. Another way, I think it's the final way, is based on the mobility of users, whether they're mobile or not. A network, a fixed network, users, the devices, do not move. It's easier to design such a network because we can predict the traffic requirements. In our access network, if we know we're within SIT, we know how many computers are in here, the number of labs, the number of offices. So for those fixed computers, we can predict how many users, we can make predictions of at what time of day that those computers are going to be used, how much data may be transferred. So we can predict how much data is being transferred and therefore design our network technology to support that data. With mobile users, that's not so easy. Consider simply our wireless LAN, effectively your mobile. Students come with a laptop. We don't know how many students are connected to our SIT wireless LAN uh, how, or how many will be connected tomorrow. Tomorrow there may be 50, the next day there may be 100. So when we design the network, how much capacity do we need? Enough to support 50 users or 100 users? And because the number of users changes over time when they're mobile, it's difficult to know what capacity is required and how to design the network. Of course, being mobile is nice. It's convenient for the users. So, a brief uh, coverage of how we could classify different networks. And now we're going to go through some example network technologies that fit within those different uh, categories. First, looking at wired networks, and then we'll look at wireless networks. And for the wired networks, we'll start by looking at access networks. So the networks that us end users use on a regular basis, not the internal core networks. We'll look at them next. So what are some example access network technologies? Ethernet and the Ethernet family of standards that support LAN-based connectivity is the main access network technology. IEEE 802.3 is the, the name of the standard for Ethernet. But in fact, there are multiple Ethernet technologies that have been developed over time, starting from, well, there was the old 10 megabit per second Ethernet. We have fast Ethernet at 100 megabits per second. Gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit per second Ethernet, and now 40 gigabit per second Ethernet. So it's developed over time, but we generally refer to it as the Ethernet set of standards. That supports access networks. We use it in offices, in homes. Most of you use Ethernet, or most of us use Ethernet every day. Even connecting, say, from your home computer to your home ADSL router or modem. Usually you'll use an Ethernet connection there. Another way is via the telephone network, which uses traditionally copper wires, copper cables. 
we can say, and this is, our categories are not, uh, do not perfectly distinguish uh, uh, between these different technologies. So here you are at home, your computer inside your home, and if you have ADSL internet access, then you have some modem, an ADSL router or modem, and you connect to that, say, via an ethernet cable. We could say that that's part of the access network, but how do you connect from that modem to the ISP? And in fact, via your home, you use the telephone line. and the telephone network is traditionally copper wires. We'll consider that as part of the access network as well. It's a way for you, or at least your home, to access the larger network. So the telephone network is one form of access network. Some cases, not so much in Thailand, in some parts of Thailand, in Bangkok, there is uh, coaxial cable, cable access for network access. All right, there's a lot of cable TV, but also we can use the cable network for internet access. So that's an access network. And in some cases, there's optical fiber that we can use for access to the larger network. And then we have wireless. I know we said we're looking at wired, but we, in terms of access network technologies, these are the main three. The telephone network, Ethernet, coaxial cable or optical fiber, and wireless. And the main wireless ones are the 802.11 wireless LAN family of standards, and in some cases Bluetooth, but not so popular for access networks. We'll talk about wireless later. Let's go through those. Ethernet. We've covered that last semester in ITS 323. Very popular local area network technology. It was originally point to multipoint, but now mainly point to point, a switch network. As a reminder, the typical configuration is that we have some switch and our computers connect to that switch and maybe that switch is then connected to a router and that router connects onto other networks. So point to point links between our end user device and a switch then connect out to possibly a core network uh, via a router. Data rates have increased over time. Who has gigabit per second ethernet on their computer? Home computer or laptop? Yes or no? One gigabit per second ethernet. Does your laptop support it? Or a computer that you use? No? Most laptops today support gigabit per second ethernet probably in the last, I don't know, three or four years at least, the LAN cards support gigabit per second ethernet. It's the device that they attach to that often does not support it, the switch. So this computer has a LAN cable, well, has a blue LAN cable going into it. The LAN card supports 10 gig, 10 megabit per second, the old ethernet, fast ethernet, 100 megabit per second, and even one gigabit per second ethernet. It can transmit and receive at that speed. But it's connected to a switch somewhere in some other room, and most likely that switch only supports 100 megabit per second at the fastest speed. If it supported one gigabit per second, 
then we could transfer one gigabit per second between this computer and the switch. So most, at least end user devices nowadays support gigabit per second ethernet. But it's the switches, new switches support gigabit per second but they cost more. That's all. Ethernet, very cheap devices. A LAN card is in terms of tens of baht, hundreds of baht to purchase. Even switches, small switches with four or five ports are in the order of hundreds of baht. Easy to install in the network because it's cheap and because the cables are easy to maneuver, we can deploy a network relatively easily. Because they've been around a long time and they're very popular, they've start, started to be adapted to non-LAN applications. Some people use the 10 gigabit per second ethernet across a city or even between cities. It's no longer local. It's moved to become a wide area network technology as well. The standards now support tens of kilometers of coverage. Connect different devices together. When you want to connect many switches or many routers together and have high speed connections, then there are interfaces between those devices that use, say, 10 gigabit per second Ethernet. So it's expanded to not just be a LAN technology, but to be technology for other purposes. But we're not going to cover any more detail. You're all experts on Ethernet. You remember the medium access control scheme? So you all know about Ethernet. But we're not going to, you don't need to go in, in any more detail for this course. We've covered some of the technology before. All we want to do in this topic is mention the technologies and compare them. But not look at, it, at any depth of how they operate. Not in this topic, at least. So let's move to the next one. How else can we access the network? Ethernet's mainly used within office buildings. What about a home user? From their house, or their dorm, or their apartment, how do they connect to the outside world? A popular approach is to use the telephone network. Telephone networks have been around before uh, computer networks, so there have been telephone networks for a hundred years or so. So it makes sense to make use of the existing infrastructure. The telephone cables have been deployed from every home into telephone exchanges. They've been there for tens of years. So to give those homes access to the network, then it makes use to use the existing telephone cable. As opposed to having someone to come and dig a hole under roads into your home to give you a new cable, optical fiber or coaxial cable. The network, the telephone network that's already deployed across cities between countries is referred to as the public switched telephone network, PSTN. The service that is delivered to the end users, the person who has a telephone, a landline telephone, is sometimes referred as a plain old telephone service, POTS. In most telephone networks, the line between the end user's home, or the end user's premise, home, office, apartment, is usually a twisted pair copper cable. And it goes to a local telephone exchange. So we use copper as a transmission medium in this case, a twisted pair of wires. How far between a home and a telephone exchange? Normally on the order of kilometers, maybe five kilometers, 10 kilometers, maybe uh, an extreme case, at least in cities. Normally we're talking about kilometers that these from your home to a local telephone exchange. So there are telephone exchanges all across Bangkok, many different telephone exchanges. So you can think of neighborhoods, or in some cases suburbs, connecting into uh, 
individual telephone exchanges. Because telephones in a large part of the, the world have been around, that means we can make use of the network to provide data communications. And that has started up as dial-up internet access. And in some countries, Integrated Services Digital Network, or SDN, and today the most common one being the DSL technologies, Digital Subscriber Line, ADSL, you know of. Let's look at them. At least let's look at, just for historical purposes, and to explain some concepts, how dial-up used to work, and then let's look at DSL technologies. But first, a survey. Hands up again if you have internet access at home. When I say home, it means your dorm, wherever you spend most of the time in the semester. Who has internet access? Maybe even Wi-Fi. Everyone and most people, okay. Who has, all right, of that, who, keep your hand up if it's wired, if it's not Wi-Fi, if it's wired. Who has internet access that is not via wireless? No one? One, two, no. Two, anyone else? Three? How is your internet access provider? Your internet access at home, what do you have? No, uh, what technology? First, wired or wireless? Wireless. What technology within wireless? Wi-Fi or mobile phone? Okay, most people have Wi-Fi internet access. And how does that wireless access point connect to the internet, do you know? We will learn in the next topic, don't worry. <laughs> we'll cover that. Okay, so some, most will have wireless access because it, at least in some places it's cheaper and easier to get access to. Uh, but many homes would have fixed wired access. Today that will be DSL technologies, ADSL. Ten, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, dial-up internet access. Has anyone used dial-up internet access before? Yes. Not much fun, not today. How did it work? First, let's look at the structure of the telephone network or remind you of the structure of the telephone network and then we'll explain how those technologies work. A very simple view of our public switch telephone network. We have end users, telephones, and they have telephone lines into local exchanges. So this is a telephone exchange. And here's another telephone exchange. And these are telephone exchanges as well. So here's one end user. Here's their local telephone exchange. So they have a cable going in there. And in fact, local telephone exchanges or telephone exchanges are normally configured in some hierarchical manner where the local ones are then connected to a larger cent central exchange. And to simplify this, we have our local exchange here Let's say it's connected to a central exchange for Bangkok. And then we have a large link, 800 kilometers or so, up to Chiang Mai, which has an exchange there, and then down to local telephone exchange in Chiang Mai, and then the user that we want to call there, or contact. Of course, there, may be, there are many other users that also connect into these exchanges. We have one cable going to the telephone exchange and that supports a particular range of frequencies. We'll talk about what range shortly. To connect the exchanges, we make use of multiplexing. Remember multiplexing? Where we combine the signals from multiple users and send them as a single signal across a single line. And that's what could happen here between the local exchange and the central exchange. Let's say we have 500 users connected to this exchange. 
all making a telephone call at the same time. So they have 500 different cables coming in here. All of those telephone calls could then be transported over a single cable using multiplexing if that single cable had enough capacity. In, for example, if it had capacity to support 600 voice calls, sometimes referred to as voice circuits, then if there's 500 people making a telephone call into this exchange, then all of their signals are sent across the single line to the central exchange. And then maybe to another exchange and so on. So we use multiplexing between the exchanges and demultiplexing as well in the opposite direction. So this would be one cable where we'd have multiple cables coming into this local exchange. We will look at the technologies that will be used. This we can think as the core network. The end users aren't connecting between these exchanges. This would be the core network. Core network. We'll look at the technologies later for that. This illustrates similar. Okay, here's our multiple users all connecting into the one local telephone exchange. Then this one telephone exchange has a connection a single connection to this central exchange, it should have a higher capacity than the individual ones. How much capacity depends upon the number of users coming in here and the statistics of how often they make calls. And people have done over tens of years, over a long time of using the telephone network analysis to work out what's the typical duration of a telephone call how often users make telephone calls and they can predict. If we have 10,000 users connected to this one exchange, they can be quite accurate and predict on average how many calls are going to be in progress at once that need to be transported across this link. And then they can dimension this link to support those calls. In the fixed telephone network, how often do you get blocking? How often do you try to make a call and you cannot because of the network? Anyone been blocked recently? Anyone used a fixed telephone line recently? Very seldom do you get blocking. That is, you pick up the phone and you, you cannot connect to someone, not because they're busy, but because the network is busy. That doesn't happen very often because because people have designed the telephone network such that the number of users making calls at the same time can be, or the traffic from those users can be carried across these links. Not so easy in a mobile telephone network. How often have you tried to make a call and the network's been busy? Anyone ever done that with a mobile phone? One person, anyone else? Maybe over New Year's, you try and make a call and the network will be busy. We mentioned that before, because of mobility, it's hard to dimension the network because the number of users in one area changes. It's hard to predict how much traffic is going to be carried across that network because of mobility. So some basics about the public switch telephone network. Now, how do we get internet access via the public switch telephone network? The, perhaps the original way was using dial-up internet access. And the basic way it worked, we have our telephone exchanges. We still have my telephone line to the exchange. I have my computer now, not my telephone. And I have a modem. What's a modem do? What's a modem do? Remember from last semester, a modem? Mm. What's it do? It doesn't route. Anyone can help him? What's a modem do? Or even what's the definition of a modem? What does the word mean? It's converted the digital signal into analog signal and it, it can, perfect, it can convert the digital signal from our computer into the analog signal to be sent across our telephone line. 
and vice versa in the opposite direction. So we have digital data coming from our computer. It needs to be sent across our telephone line, which supports an analog signal. So the modem does that conversion process. Um, it does modulation, modulator, and at the reverse, and demodulation, demodulator. So we have our telephone line, and now we have a modem. And in dial-up internet access, what we would do, we would pay an internet service provider for access. We would use our modem to make a telephone call to their dial-up server. So here's our internet service provider. They have a special dial-up server connected to the, one of the telephone exchanges. We call their number and that makes a telephone connection from here to here. Same as if I call from here to here, it makes a connection between them. But now it's not between two telephones, it's between our modem and the dial-up server. We create a connection. From the network's perspective, it's just a telephone call, just a single connection there. But the internet service provider has their own network and they connect to the larger network via the core networks, to the larger internet. So we make a connection and then we start sending our data across that. So our data goes across the telephone network to the ISP's dial-up server and then out to the internet. They send it out on our behalf. This uses a single voice channel when we make that call. We make a telephone call there. And the amount of bandwidth assigned to the voice channel across our copper cable is four kilohertz. So the telephone supports transmitting analog signals of a bandwidth of four kilohertz. And that's all we can use when we use the dial-up server. We use, if we go back to, remember, Nyquist, and we use different signaling levels, it turns out if we have four kilohertz of bandwidth, the maximum data rate we can achieve at a certain signaling level is, it's around 64 kilobits per second minus some overhead in practice for our dial-up modem, 56 kilobits per second. Because of the limitation of the four kilohertz voice channel that we use to send our data, we're limited to sending at a data rate of 56 kilobits per second from here to here. From here to the outside world or to the, out to the internet, there's no such limit. But across that telephone channel, there's the limit of 56 kilobits per second. So if you use dial-up internet, the fastest modem you could buy is 56 kilobits per second. Not so useful today. How do we improve upon that? Digital subscriber line, which is more commonly used today for home internet access, DSL, uses the same copper telephone line, uses the same transmission medium, but in fact makes use of a different portion of the spectrum on that telephone line. The telephone line, the copper wire, supports a bandwidth of about one megahertz. But when you make a voice call, you only use the first four kilohertz. So if this is the first, or this is the 1,000 kilohertz, one megahertz, the telephone service only uses the first part, about the first four kilohertz. Plus we leave some space so that there's no interference. So it's shown here up to 20 kilohertz. This is the plain old telephone service. When you make a phone call, you use this portion of the spectrum of the cable from your home to the exchange. And when you use dial-up internet access, you can only use this portion of the spectrum. But the copper cable can carry larger frequency signals, up to about one megahertz. So what DSL does is makes use of that remaining portion of the spectrum, that bandwidth from here up to one megahertz. And it does it in different ways. One example of how it does it is that it allocates what well, this about 200 kilohertz for the upstream, that's from your home to the exchange, or upload, 
and in this case from about 750 kilohertz for downstream from the exchange to your home. So you can send analog signals up and down at the same time. This is using frequency division multiplexing. We have sending data at the same time over three different frequencies essentially. Down, we can be downloading, we can be uploading, and we can be making a telephone call at the same time using the single copper cable by sending signals at different frequencies. So to improve upon the very limited data rate that dial-up offers, DSL uses the rest of the copper spectrum up to about one megahertz. It sends digital signals from our home, from the modem, now not a dial-up modem but an ADSL modem or a DSL modem, to some device in a telephone exchange, referred to as a multiplexer. DSL, so be careful with the term terminology, DSL or digital subscriber line, we're now sending digital signals. It's a general uh, term. There are different standards within the DSL family. There's ADSL, SDSL, HDSL, VDSL. ADSL shown here is just one example of DSL, the most common one. So this is another diagram that shows the topology of the network using ADSL, the typical what we have at home if you have wired internet access. We have our public telephone network that goes to the rest of the world for phone calls. We have our internet and our internet service provider. So you subscribe to some ISP, you pay them some money to use their service. At home, you have your computer, or computers, a telephone. You have a modem to take the signal from your computer and send it as the DSL signal across the copper wire. You'll often have a filter to, to separate out any interference from the telephone and the uh, computer signals so that no signals that are transmitted from your computer interfere with the telephone and vice versa. And here is the cable, this line here is the cable from your home to the telephone exchange. So this is some telephone exchange here. And the ISP puts a special device in the telephone exchange, an ADSL multiplexer, it's a multiplexer. It takes multiple input signals uh, and combines into, into one and vice versa, sometimes referred to as a DSLAM, a DSL access multiplexer. And what that does is then uses the ISP's network, not necessarily the telephone network, now maybe using optical fiber or some other technology to connect into their network and then out to the internet. So your internet traffic goes to the telephone exchange and the ADSL multiplexer which then sends it out to the internet. Your telephone calls at the same time go over the same copper wire to the exchange and then out to the public switch telephone network. And of course you can make a telephone call and send your uh, data up and down at the same time. because we have a larger bandwidth, we can transmit at much larger speeds than that the dial-up was limited to. ADSL, or asymmetric digital subscriber line, is one example of DSL, and the most common one used today. Asymmetric in terms of the bandwidth for upload and download, or upstream and downstream much larger bandwidth allocated for downstream than for upstream. Why? Well, two reasons. One is that well, it's useful for most end users. Most end users download more than they upload. Therefore, it makes sense from the ISP's perspective 
to let them download faster, then they have to upload and then they'll get a better user experience. And the other reason is that the multiplexes in the exchange can support sending larger bandwidths down than up. If you want to send large upstream bandwidths, then it becomes more complex uh, at the exchange. So we have higher download speeds than upload speeds available with ADSL. ADSL can adapt the data rate. We'll see some examples of the maximum data rate it supports shortly, but it can change the data rate depending upon the condition of your line and the amount of noise on it. Your telephone line from your home to the exchange, I may live one kilometre from the exchange, someone else may live five kilometres from the exchange. Someone else may live one kilometre from the exchange, but their copper cable is 50 years old and it's degrading and it's poor quality. So the quality of the signals that we can send across those three, in those three different scenarios differs. So what ADSL does, it adapts the data rate depending upon the quality of the signal received. Generally, if you're closer to the exchange, you can get a higher data rate because you get a stronger signal. If you've got a better quality line, you can get a higher data rate. So the key features of ADSL is it makes use of the existing telephone network. And it supports data rates that make, users or make it possible for users to use typical browsing and internet applications, voice applications, and standard quality video applications. We'll compare that to the other technologies once we go through them. How fast? Here's some examples. Examples of typical, or in some cases quite old now, different downlink speeds and the corresponding uplink speeds for different uh, ADSL packages. A common one today may be 8 megabit per second down, downlink as at the same time as uh, up to about 1 megabit per second uplink. Yeah? Is there a VDSL in Thailand? Sorry? Is there a VDSL in Thailand? Is there a VDSL in Thailand? Uh, that's a good question. I know there's uh, other than I know there's HDSL in some places and I think even SHDSL has been used. Possibly it may be used if... I know there's some uh, coaxial networks in some parts of the cities and that there's optical fibre. In some cases VDSL is used over a distance of tens of metres from a optical fibre exchange to a home. I don't know whether the providers of optical fibre in Thailand use VDSL or not, possibly, but not so common for sure. It would be hard to go to an ISP and say I want VDSL to the home. We'll mention a little bit about the differences of these in a moment and what this means. First, ADSL. ADSL has evolved over time, starting with the original ADSL, now ADSL 2, there's a standard and 2 plus. The main one in Thailand is ADSL. What limits you to get ADSL? Most modems that you buy today support ADSL2 and even ADSL2+. In fact, the modem I bought five years ago supported them. So the modems for the end users support the high speeds. But the exchange, the multiplexes in the exchange need to also support the high speeds for you to be able to get those high speeds. And it differs between different internet service providers inside Thailand today as to what's supported. It also depends upon distance you are from exchange. But the technology can go up to about, or can go up to 24 megabits per second download, at the same time three and a half megabits per second upload with ADSL 2 plus. But there are DSL technologies other than ADSL that is, they're not necessarily asymmetric in terms of downlink and uplink. 
they may be symmetric. High data rate DSL, symmetric DSL, very high speed DSL, VDSL, and some others as well. And some typical speeds shown here. So in some cases they're symmetric, so uplink and downlink are the same. More commonly used for businesses than not so often offered to end users, to consumers. Uh, used, say, to connect between two businesses, two offices in some cases. VDSL is used, at least in some countries, I'm not sure in Thailand, but it's in some countries where you have a telephone exchange or a, an exchange or node that is very close to the home. That is, you have fibre to the curb. C means curb. So on a street, on the side of the street, you have the curb. The concept is that you have a special device, say for a street, of houses along that street, one device per street. Coming to that device is optical fibre. We'll cover optical fibre later, but it gives very high speeds. And then from that device into the home, you have the normal copper telephone line, and over that copper telephone line, you don't use ADSL, you use VDSL. And that can provide much higher data rates. But it's over much shorter distances, tens of metres, as opposed to kilometres in these cases. We will touch upon fibre to the curb and optical fibre shortly when we look at core networks. Let's see if we can find an example. Last year I could look at my own home modem, but this year it's not possible. But I have a picture. This is more exciting example last year because we did it live, but this year I cannot do it. It's just a photo. This is my home ADSL modem. And at the modem you know you can you subscribe to a package with ADSL, you pay per month to an internet service provider, and you can check the for the modem the data rate that it connects to the exchange at. Note that the data rate can go up and down. I pay for I think it's advertised as 6 megabits per second download. It's actually 7,168 kilobits per second download. I pay for that per month, but if the quality of my line, my telephone line is low, or if I'm a long way from the exchange, even if I pay for 6 megabits per second, ADSL may adapt the rate to be lower. It won't go higher because I only pay for 6, but ADSL may change the data rate over time depending upon the quality of the signal on your telephone line. At this point in time I had uh, well, it's about 7 megabits per second down speed. The near end bit rate, the bit rate at my end, at the end of the modem, and at the far end, that is at the exchange, going from me to the exchange, 637 kilobits per second, which is less than one megabit per second upload speed. Uh, the other diagram is some more detail about the quality of the signal. So again, this is information provided by my home modem, ADSL modem. It's telling me, so the, ho the modem in my home, it measures the signal quality across the telephone line. And it's not so easy to follow here, but it gives some measurement of the noise, measured in decibels. And all these numbers here are giving a measure of, of that bandwidth that we have if you remember back to one of the slides, we have a certain bandwidth for up, uplink and a larger bandwidth for downlink. 
of that bandwidth available, different portions of it are getting a high quality signal and some portions may be getting a low quality signal. And uh, these different tones are giving some measurement of the quality of the signal at different frequencies of my uh, uh, DSL line. From memory, this was last year, everything was okay. You need to look up some manuals to understand what all these numbers mean. But that's the near end performance. And now if we look at the far end, Note that if there's anything you can see here, there's zeros here. So this is the first part of the channel. We have one megahertz. The first part is for the telephone, then for uplink, and then the rest is for downlink. You can think of this as the, uh, the lowest frequency, and down here we have the highest frequency. And where we have numbers, it indicates the signal strength, essentially, or is it indicator of the signal strength or quality at that frequency. So for the low frequencies, we have zero signal strength. And then it goes up. This is the measurement at my modem, the near end. So it's actually measuring the downlink signal. If we look at the uplink signal, we see that the signal is strong at these lower frequencies. That is the uplink range of the bandwidth. Everything is zero for the downlink. So that corresponds to that diagram or the slide that looks like this. these numbers are saying at the lower range of the spectrum we have strong signal zero in the other portion and in this case in this range of the spectrum we have a strong signal so it's just giving an indicator of the signal quality at the downlink and uplink you need to look further details of the manual to really understand how that's useful but if you have a poor quality signal, these numbers will change. And they'll give you an indicator of how good the signal strength is to the telephone exchange. I cannot show you any more because I cannot access the modem right now. We said one of the, well, the key features of DSL and ADSL, uses a telephone network, supports basic voice and video applications. Who, again, two, two or three of you had DSL or had wired internet access at home? Yes? yes. Have you used it for voice communications, Skype or similar? Yes. Works okay? And most people would have used uh, Skype and it works okay. What about video? Download streaming video works okay. You can watch videos on YouTube. Video conversation works okay generally. What about the quality of the video? Could you watch a video the size of this screen at high definition quality with your ADSL? Have you tried? On a large screen TV? Possibly not. Once you start to get to high quality digital t content, digital TV, high definition content, then the data rate of 24 megabits per second even 
is starting to push the limits. Maybe you can support a high definition video stream, but supporting two high definition video streams at the same time starts to push the limits. So ADSL is okay for basic video services, but maybe in the future, next five or 10 years, if there's a home and you want to stream all of the TV content via the internet to that home, then ADSL may not be fast enough. And that's why other technologies uh, are around. What other technologies can we use? Coaxial cable or optical fiber? Coaxial cables have been used for cable TV networks. So many places have cables coming to them and the TV is delivered by that. We can use the same cables for network access, for data communications. It's a separate physical network than the telephone network. So, if in your home you have your telephone, then out of your home you may have your telephone line, your copper telephone line. If you have cable TV to your home, then you also have an additional line coming out. Usually installed and operated by a different company. Sometimes the same company, sometimes different. But two different cables coming into your home providing two different services, one for telephone, one for TV. We can use either of them for internet access, we could use ADSL over here, but we can also use the coaxial cable for internet access. It has a much larger bandwidth available and therefore we can get higher data rates than the copper telephone line. Typically, the way that coaxial cable has been deployed is that it's shared amongst homes or uh, end-user premises uh, in some small area, across a building or between multiple homes. That is, we have a point-to-multipoint link that each home attaches to. Maybe you have 10 homes attached to that point-to-multipoint link. That means you need to share the bandwidth amongst those users. So a typical configuration is using a point to multipoint topology. As a result, if you share amongst multiple users, the more users using it at the same time, the less you will get. So in fact, in some coaxial cable networks, maybe at 3 a.m. when you're doing your assignment, you may get the full 30 megabits per second, but at 8 p.m. when everyone else in your neighborhood is using the same network, maybe you need to share it amongst them and you'll get much lower data rate. So that's one of the differences compared to DSL. In DSL, every home has its own telephone line, dedicated point-to-point -point link. Doesn't matter who else is using the, the network, you've got your own physically separate line. The standard used for internet or data communications across cable is DOCSIS, Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. And, it, and that has varied and improved over time, DOCSIS 1, 2 and 3. Some typical data rates, I think this is DOCSIS 2, or DOCSIS 1, 6 megabit per second download, about or less than 1 megabit per second up, upload, and a con one today is 30 megabits per second download, about one megabit per second upload. And there's improved versions which give faster speeds. So here we use the coaxial cable normally provided by TV networks for data communications. We can generally get faster data rates than ADSL, but it's a shared medium. So sometimes, depending on how many users in your neighborhood, you may have to uh, put up with a lower data rate at some point in time. 
you can have both telephone lines in your home and use this for telephone and use this for internet access and for TV. Or you could tell your telephone operator to not remove the line but no longer pay for that line. You need to pay rental for your telephone line. If you use your coaxial cable for internet access then you start to use voice over IP then you can use the telephone over the internet provided by the co coaxial cable and no longer have to pay for the rental for the telephone line. So that's one possibility of using coaxial cable. It's got speeds high enough to have use voice over IP to make telephone calls in replacement for your typical fixed telephone. And in fact ADSL can do that as well. So that's an alternative to using the copper telephone network. Use coaxial cable. Anyone have it? No, not many people. It's available in some parts of Thailand, coaxial cable, so you can pay and get a 30 megabit per second download speed, but it's not widespread at the moment. It depends upon where you are. The next alternative is optical fiber. Optical fiber is mostly used in core networks. Remember we're still talking about access networks, wired access networks, how you get access to the larger internet. Optical fiber is used a lot in core networks and we'll talk about that later. But it can be used for an access network, for delivering to the end user. It can be used instead of the copper and coaxial cables. Your home, if you don't have coaxial cable, you don't want to use the copper telephone network, you want faster data rates, then there's a third option, having an optical fiber directly into your home. But there are some variations of that. When that's not possible to get optical fiber directly into your home, we can get optical fiber close to your home and there are some benefits of that. And we get concepts referred to as fiber to the home, where we have optical fiber coming direct into the home. Fiber to the, also called fiber to the premise. Oh, I haven't listed them here, somewhere else. But others we have is fibre to the curb. We saw that before, FTTC, where we have optical fibre to, to, say, a street level to one special device, and then from that special device to each home, we use the copper wires. And there's another one, fibre to the node, which is similar, optical fibre to some special node, maybe for a neighbourhood, and then use copper from that node to the individual homes. We will talk more about them when we cover, I think after the midterm, IPTV. How do we provide high quality TV over the internet? And that's when optical fibre becomes key. But basically giving optical fibre closer to the home can give you higher speeds. Because optical fibre has a much higher bandwidth and we can transmit therefore at much higher data rates. Typical speeds where countries and, and areas have optical fibre to the home around 100 megabits per second. In some places, one gigabit per second. Usually shared between users, not always. So where you have fibre to the home, you can pay for a package that delivers 100 megabits per second. And some parts of Thailand have that as well. There are some operators that will offer that service just in small parts of cities where they've deployed the network. So much higher data rates than the previous technologies. It can support everything, data, voice, video and high quality video. You can start to support high definition TV streams. The problem with optical fibre is that it's not deployed 
in many places. Not many homes have an optical fiber cable coming into them. Most homes have copper telephone lines. Some have coaxial cable. Not many have optical fiber. Therefore, to offer the service using optical fiber, some company needs to go and deploy the network. And that is an expensive task for a company to do. Digging holes through cities and so on is very expensive. So let's summarize, and that will finish for today, once we summarize on wired access networks. We're talking about end users getting access to the larger network using wired technologies. The options we have, normally inside offices and buildings, we have Ethernet, LAN technologies, very common. Then from homes and, or from buildings to uh, telephone exchange or to uh, other sites, ISPs, if we're using the telephone network, we have in the past dial up and now DSL technologies. The advantage is that they make use of the existing telephone network. The infrastructure is there. The disadvantage compared to the next technologies is they're slightly slower. We're talking about tens of megabits per second. Coaxial cable, we can get faster speed than DSL but it's not deployed as widely in some countries as copper telephone lines. In different countries it varies. In some countries coaxial cable is deployed widely, some countries it's hardly there at all. In most countries there's telephone networks. And then as another third alternative is optical fiber to the building or becoming to the home is becoming more popular. Especially in areas where it's densely populated in Japan, in South Korea, where it makes sense to deploy optical fiber to buildings and event eventually to homes. Higher data rates, but it's very costly to deploy that network, to build the network. So until the costs come down, you will not see that spread as much. So they are the main techniques or technologies we have available for accessing the larger internet. The others we have are wireless technologies and we'll cover them uh, towards the end of this topic. Enough talking for today. Don't leave just yet though. Uh, let's see if we've missed anything. Tomorrow we'll look at core network technologies, the internal networks run by ISPs and telecom operators.